गुड मॉर्निंग स्टूडेंट्स कैन यू हियर माई वॉइस यस सर यस सर थैंक यू so so far we are discussing about the basics of solid state physics uh, and then after that we discussed about semiconductors band theory of course band theory based on band theory we divided the solids into metals insulators and semiconductors so after that we spent some time on semiconductor physics uh, particularly we are interested in the intrinsic semiconductors okay. so there we calculated the charge carrier concentration and so on then after that we went on to the uh, the three fundamental uh, nano structures like quantum well quantum wire and quantum dot so in those three systems we calculated the uh, dispersion relation and then uh, density of states right so now we'll move on to the next topic which is a carrier transport phenomena so now uh, in semiconductors uh, i think in this particular topic we are going to understand how the charge carrier transport phenomena takes place in semiconductors okay so before going into the transport phenomena now let's try to understand few definitions basically these are some of the characteristic length scales in the system uh, i think uh, these are very important based on the relation uh, between the length scale the characteristic length scales and the system size we can divide the transport uh, regime into different categories so then we can study each transport uh, regime in based on the its properties so let's uh, try to learn some of the basic definitions of this characteristic length scales so the first one is a mean free path so usually we are going to denote with lm does anybody know the meaning of definition of mean free path <clears throat> do you have an idea about the mean free path okay so mean free path is nothing but the average distance traveled by an electron uh, before it experiences elastic collision so that means now an electron is moving from here and it's an another electron or some other uh, lattice and it has another collision okay so these are the two collisions so between these two successive collisions the average distance traveled by this electron is called the mean free path so we can define lm which is the mean free path is velocity times tau m where tau m is the average uh, the time between these two successive elastic collisions you have to remember these are these events okay let me put some circles these are events of collisions so these are elastic collisions i hope you remember the you know the elastic collisions means the momentum is conserved okay so the tau m is the the average I mean, the, the time taken for these two successive collisions or you can say the momentum relaxation time or you can say the time taken between two successive collisions and of course this v is the average velocity okay so this is the definition for the mean free path now usually in high mobility semiconductors high mobility semiconductors at temperature less than 4 kelvin one can have estimate the mean free path length is the order of 
10 to 100 nanometers. Okay. So this is a, a rough estimation of the main free path in high mobility semiconductors. Basically, it depends on several factors. One of the factor is the temperature. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the definition for the main free path of an electron in a semiconductor or in any other metal. But we are interested in the semiconductors in this section. Now let me go to the second characteristic lens scale. It's called phase relaxation. Length. We are going to denote with L phi. Okay. So, what is the definition for this phase relaxation length? So, basically, this is the average distance traveled by an electron before it experiences a uh, inelastic collisions. So, that means the average distance traveled by an electron between two successive inelastic collisions. Remember, these are inelastic collisions. Now, let's say an electron is going in this direction and it experienced an inelastic collision, it went in another direction. Okay. So remember, here you have to remember, remember is, so here, okay. Uh, is it clear now? No, Can you sir. hear my voice? Yes, sir, it's clear. No? No, sir, actually it's clear. Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay. Uh, I think the problem could be I'm using my mobile network data, uh, but I'll try to keep the microphone close to my close to me so that you can hear. So I'm talking about the phase relaxation length. It is the average distance traveled by an electron between two successive inelastic collisions. Inelastic collisions. Okay. So usually, what happens in the inelastic collisions? The energy is not conserved, right? And do you know any other examples of inelastic collisions in solids? Any idea? Sir, can you please repeat the question again? Do you know any other uh, any examples of inelastic collisions in solids? Have you heard about electron-electron interaction? So this is some kind of inelastic collision. Okay, when an electron experiences another electron, so there is some kind of interaction. Of course, usually people will collision, but some kind of there's an interaction. So electron-electron interaction is example for inelastic collisions in solids, and also electron phonon. This phonon interaction, I mean electron phonon interaction. Basically, the interaction between an electron and an ion, so moving ion. Okay, so these are the two examples for inelastic collisions in solids. Very common uh, examples. Okay, so what is the phase relaxation length? It's the average distance traveled by an electron between two successive inelastic collisions. So you can define L phi is equal to the Fermi velocity into tau phi. Okay, so Vf is the Fermi velocity. Okay. And of course, this tau phi is the average uh, time between two successive collisions, inelastic collisions. And remember, this uh, expression is valid for uh, high mobility degenerate semiconductors. high mobility degenerate semiconductors. <clears throat> now let me define the third uh, character lens skin. So this is the well known de Broglie wavelength. So usually we denote with the lambda. Now how do you define the de Broglie wavelength for a, an electron or a particle? 2 pi over 
wave octa k, right? Is that correct? So this, this, so this is the expression for the de Broglie wavelength, where k is the wave vector. Now I think we'll, we can write down this expression using the dispersion relation or kinetic energy for a free electron. Kinetic energy E is equal to h bar k square to m star. Do you remember? In semiconductors or in metals, we are talking about the effective mass, right? So this effective mass is coming because of the atomic potential. Now from this expression, you can calculate the expression K, that is 2 m star E over h square to the power 1 by 2. So now I'll substitute back into the uh, de Broglie wavelength lambda expression, that is 2 pi over k so that is um, we are 2 m star e to the power 1 by 2 and h bar is that okay so i think you can simplify a little further 2 m star e to the power 1 by 2 so this is the uh, the de Broglie expression of an electron with a kinetic energy e with an effective mass m star Now, basically, what is the, I think, uh, many of you know, right, the de Broglie wavelength lambda, uh, basically, it enter into the, when you're going from classical uh, picture to quantum picture, right? So, basically, what happens if the, <coughs> the system size is of the, of the order of de Broglie wavelength, then the quantum mechanical effects comes into the picture. So, usually, we'll treat the particle as a, uh, having a wave nature. Okay, so so this is the expression for the de Broglie wavelength lambda, and of course it, it also depends on the several factors like one of the temperature and the potential and so on. Now the fourth one is the magnetic length. Uh, I think uh, I don't. Know. Okay. So, what is this magnetic length? How many of you know the Zeeman effect? Can anybody tell me what is the Zeeman effect? Whether my question is clear, does anybody know the Zeeman effect? Yes, sir. Can you tell me what is Zeeman effect? By applying magnetic field, uh, we are getting splitting of the energy levels. Okay. okay. Good. So usually what happens when you put an electron in an external magnetic field, its energy levels are quantized and those energy levels are called Lando levels. Okay. So usually these Lando levels are denoted with the index n. So I'm going to denote the en plus half h bar omega c. By looking at this expression, you can get some kind of idea, right? So these energy levels are looking like uh, harmonic oscillator energy levels, right? This is the uh, the zero energy, and this is the uh, number of particles in the harmonic oscillator energy level this is the frequency right so usually what happens when you put an electron in external magnetic field so it will and ener its energy will be quantized and uh, the energy is lando level energy that is given by en is equal to n plus half h bar omega c where omega c is called cyclotron frequency cyclotron frequency and its expression is given to omega c is equal to e b by m star. Okay, so I think uh, for the time being, you just uh, try to uh, learn the magnetic length definition. But these things you will understand when you go to the quantum mechanics. Now, what is the magnetic length? 
So we understood that when you put an electron in external magnetic field, its energy levels are quantized with an energy h bar omega c into n plus half, where n is the index for the Lando levels. Now the magnetic length is defined as Lb. This is h bar over Eb. To the power. So this is one of the characteristics. And now this electron will try to have a rotation around this field direction. Okay. So these are called cyclotron orbits, and the corresponding energy will be n plus half h bar omega c. So the radius of this orbit is lb. So that is what we are calling magnetic length. By looking at this expression, you can understand that the radius of the cyclotron orbit can be tunable with the magnetic field strength P, because this is 1 over B, right? So this is a, one of the important uh, characteristics length scale. I don't know how many of you know how to calculate this expression. Uh, let me do it here. <laughs> Let's say if you put an electron in a perpendicular magnetic field, can you write down the equation of motion for this electron? M R double dot minus G yeah. square by M R square. Uh, okay, first we'll try to write, write down uh, force, right? Mass of an electron into its acceleration times what is the force acting on a uh, electron due to the magnetic field ebb okay of course that will be a cross product right because of this perpendicular direction the sine theta becomes one so tell me what is that charge of an electron into v bar cross velocity v bar and yeah velocity into magnetic field Yes, of course, there will be sine theta, but 90 degrees, right? So sine 90 becomes 1 EVP. Okay, so from this expression, what we can calculate is, uh, I think we can calculate uh, radius. Maybe you can write down dv dt EVP. Uh, I want to calculate the radius. Uh, from this expression. Will it helpful? Uh, so then we consider mv square by lb equals to uh, Tell me once again. So the centri centri uh, centripetal force equals to the force. Uh, so you have to consider the centrifugal force because okay. it is a non-inertial frame. Yes, and of course it is a uh, Close uh, path, right? Okay. So, tell me what is that expression? M B square by R. M M V square by. R. Okay. M V square by R, where R is the radius of the cyclotron orbit. This is equal to. E B B. Okay, EVP. So I think from this expression, I can calculate the radius of this circular orbit is equal to M times V times B. Okay, one V will cancel. Is that okay? Where is the yes. charge of an electron? EB. Okay. Now you can calculate the angular momentum L is equal to MVR, where R is the radius of the circular orbit. And this should be quantized, right? So that should be equal to n uh, h bar. Now you substitute the value of rc here, then you can calculate rc square is equal to n h bar over eb. Okay. 
so you can write down rc is equal to square root of n into h bar over eb to the power 1 by 2 now this n is the constant right because it's an integer so this is an integer so this is the length so this length is nothing but the magnetic length okay so basically this is the of course if you have a first uh, orbit it will have a radius h bar over eb to the power 1 by 2 if you go to the second orbit uh, then it will be root 2 e times and third orbit will be root 3 times and so on so this is how i think we can derive this uh, the magnetic length okay now the last one will be uh, thermal length so so i think you can directly calculate uh, lt is equal to h bar vf over kbt where kbt is the thermal energy of an electron and of course vf is the fermi velocity okay now so we got the uh, some of the definitions of this kinetic length scales of an electron or charge carriers in a semiconductor now what is the use now suppose now we have a two important uh, uh, the quantities let's say one is the system size let's say i have a system with the size capital l so this is the system size suppose if the system size is uh, less than any of these kinetic length scales then we can uh, define i mean we can classify the transport into different regimes for the first uh, classification is classical diffusion transport diffusive transport regime or transport now when we can achieve this kind of uh, transport when the system size is much much greater than this main free path phase relaxation length and so on okay so if the system size is greater than this mean free path and phase relaxation length then you can say the transport through the system will be classical diffusive transport now what are the two main uh, main mechanism behind this classical diffusive transport one is drift mechanism second one is diffusion or diffusion okay so these are the two main mechanisms for uh, in the classical transport okay so i think in this lecture i am going to talk about this classical transport basically i will talk about this drift transport mechanism and diffusion transport mechanism now what is the second classification that's a coherent transport coherent transport now what is the when we can have a coherent transport when the system size that is capital l is less than the phase coherent length l pi then you can achieve this coherent transport in the system now that means the wave functions of these charge carriers will be well defined uh, throughout the transport now in this coherent transport regime basically the main important phenomena you can observe is hanna bohm effect oscillations you can observe this important phenomena in the coherent transport regime so if you are interested you just go back and uh, try to learn about it. get some idea about a hollow bomb effect now what is the third uh, transport regime that is the velocistic velocistic transport now uh, when we can achieve this velocistic transport when the system size is less than mean free path okay then you can achieve the velocistic transport what do you mean by velocistic 
it's like a bullet transport so without any scattering so there will not be any change in the direction of the momentum or change in the magnitude of the momentum so the charge carriers will not experience any scattering mechanism they directly transport from one end to the other end without any scattering effects so such uh, transport is called velocity transport okay so i think uh, out of these three transport regimes as i told you in this lecture we are talking about i think we will try to learn about this classical diffusive transport and in this classical diffusive transport mechanism uh, the, the main two mechanisms are drift velocity drift transport and diffusion <clears throat> so we are interested in classical diffusive transport okay now let me try to explain uh, with some pictures now let's say this is my system and i just connected to the a potential difference so that i can have a transport or uh, moment of charge carriers from one end to the other end here i have applied a potential difference v and um, so this is the positive terminal and this is the negative terminal so the electric field direction will be in this direction so this is the field direction now what happens because of the field direction the electrons will go in from negative end to the positive end so that is the opposite to the direction of the field direction now let's say this Uh, field circles are electrons okay so the electrons will go in the opposite direction to the field direction but in semiconductors we have another charge carrier right those are called holes so these open circles are represent called holes let's say and they are moving in the field direction is that okay so this kind of Uh, the moment of charge carriers due to the field is called drift the moment of carriers charge carriers uh due to electric field okay it's called drift so whatever velocity they achieve is called drift velocity whatever current we get this because of this drift is called drift current and so on okay now what about another uh, mechanism am i connected okay so the second one is let's say this is the first mechanism the second one is diffusion now let me take a sample uh, system suppose the system has a non uniform charge distribution let's say i have large number of electrons at this end okay now let's say this some kind of we have a uh, division or a, some kind of separation from one region to another region so in the first region in the left side region we have more number of charge carriers now what happens after some time these charge carriers will try to diffuse from high concentration region to the low concentration region to attain the i mean to obtain the equilibrium okay so okay so the charge carriers will move from high concentration region to the low concentration region so the flow of charge carriers due to the <clears throat> concentration gradient is called diffusion the flow of uh, carriers due to concentration gradient what do you mean by concentration this is the number of charge carriers per unit area okay concentration gradient usually you could denote with let's say if this is the x axis then you can write down dn over 
dx. Okay, so the density is changing with respect to this x-axis. So this is what we call diffusion. So this is in a simple word. Now let's uh, let's uh, we'll go to the more details. So for any questions, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Now let's try to understand this drift velocity. Okay. Now let me draw some picture. Now let me try to imagine the 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 trajectory of an electron. Okay. Now let's say the electron is started from this position, and after reaching this point, let's say it had a collision, uh, and then its direction got changed, so it went into another direction, and after some time, it had another collision. So it went to the this position, third position. Okay. Now let me denote this with one. This is the two, and this is the three. <clears throat> okay. Let's say I can imagine this. Uh, let's say after the third uh, collision, it had another collision, and it came back. So from this picture, what I want to say that the motion of an electron in a solid is completely random is that okay so that is what the main essence of this picture <clears throat> so when you have a random motion what will be the average velocity will be zero right the average distance traveled by an electron is completely zero okay for the time being forget about velocity the average uh, the, the total net displacement will become zero okay so you cannot have any uh, current or you cannot have any transport uh, property because of this random motion. <clears throat> now what we'll do is we'll try to apply an external electric field. Okay. Now because of this applied electric field in this direction, let's say the direction of an electric field is towards uh, left to right. So this is the direction of an ele applied electric field. Now, because of this applied electric field, let's try to imagine what will happen to this motion. Now, this uh, the electron in the going in the first uh, direction, you know. So it's one of the component which is will get affected by this electric field. So the resultant you can write down. So it will be like this. Okay. So this is the first trajectory because one of the component of the velocity vector got drifted okay because of this electric field <clears throat> so this is the direction now what will happen to this second path okay so this is the <clears throat> i'm sorry <clears throat> second path now this third path will also drift towards the field direction one of the component velocity okay so this is the third now what about the fourth one this one okay now let's see uh, in the first case in the absence of field let's say that the distance or uh, the net displacement is very small in fact maybe if you take several such collisions will become zero but this is the one but now because in the in the presence of an electric field you see the net displacement from here to here right so there's a let's just the the, the net displacement is a little larger compared to the in the absence of field direction so what i would like to say that in the presence of an external electric field the electron will try to drift towards the electric field and because of the drift it will have a finite displacement and you can have a net current 
<clears throat> okay so the main point i want to mention here is in the absence of electric field what are the quantities will be zero the average velocity is zero right because of the random motion so the net displacement net displacement will be zero so you cannot have a transport mechanism and, and you cannot have a current so that is what happens in the absence of electric field but when you have a magnetic field i mean electric field the electric field try to drift the electrons towards the field direction so you can you can achieve a finite net displacement so you can have a current okay so this is what the main uh, mechanism happens thing will happen in the drift uh, drifting the electron due to the field field now we'll try to understand another definition called drift velocity okay so can anybody define the drift velocity now now can you tell me the, the how do you define the drift velocity after understanding this picture uh, the average velocity gained oh. by the electron yes by the average velocity that an electron gained right or achieved by the field that's it so the average velocity uh, that an electron remember here you can talk about holes also because you are in a semiconductor so electrons are holes uh, achieved due to applied field remember electric field okay so that's what we call drift velocity but then you can under, i mean you can get a doubt whether we can increase the drift velocity as long as you want no that is not correct so the if you plot the velocity versus uh, a field electric field so let's say this is the drift velocity i'm denoting with v sub x d so in a real systems first for a small fields it will increase linearly and after that it will try to attain i mean try to attain the saturation okay. so this constant velocity is called saturation velocity okay so this is vs and this linear so this is the drift velocity region so in a real systems what happens after crossing some certain uh, critical electric field the velocity of this charge carriers will remain constant so you will have a finite current okay but below this critical field the velocity increases the drift velocity increases with the electric field strength so you, the current will also increase okay so the drift velocity is directly proportional to electric field but you remember this is up to a certain point of the electric field and of course at the same time uh, i think now uh, there's some confusion here so what i'll do is i'll just you are talking about drift velocity of an electron and drift velocity of a hole p so this is directly proportional to the opposite direction okay do you remember in the picture the electrons the, the direction of motion of electrons is opposite to the field and uh, the direction of holes is along the field direction so there will be negative sign here okay so now we can put some proportionality constant we can put some proportionality con constant that is mu n times e here also you can put uh, this is the drift velocity of holes is equal to minus mu p times e where mu n and 
mu p are called uh, mobility okay mobility of an electron or uh, hole okay if you take mu p means it's the mobility for the hole so how do you define the mobility of a charge carrier it's the ratio of the drift velocity to the applied electric field is that okay is it clear yes sir yes. and of course if you can apply these classical mechanics uh, by writing the equation of motion you can calculate the this mu n is equal to e tau by m star okay just by applying the uh, mechanics you can get this expression where mu n is the mobility which is directly proportional to the this uh, tau this tau is the uh, the time the average uh, the time taken between the two successive collisions and it's inversely proportional to the effective mass so from this expression you can understand that if the effective mass is very high the mobility will be low right so in semiconductors you can have different regimes where the where the effective mass will have a different values so the mobility will also change depending on the value of this uh, effective mass and of course depends on the collision rate also okay if you are having very high frequent collisions the time the tau will decreases so the mobility will decreases okay <clears throat> so once you know these mobilities i think now you can calculate the the drift current density uh, due to the electrons and holes as j and so this is the uh, how do you say this is current uh, density right so that is charge of an electron into the density of an electrons the mobility and electric field okay so basically this is sigma times the applied field of course this is the vector quantity the current density is a vector quantity but current is not a vector quantity so what is this j j is nothing but the current per unit area okay so similarly you can write down the current density for holes so let's say this is the charge of a hole let's say this is charge of an electron and density of holes and its mobility times the electric field so this is sigma n is the conductivity of electrons uh this holes and the electric field okay what is sigma n sigma n is the conductivity due to electrons and of course sigma p is the conductivity due to the holes now you can write down the total drift current density that is j is equal to jn plus jp so usually what happens uh, what is the the charge of an electron let's say you will take mod e that is same as the charge of a hole so you can take it outside n into mu n plus p that is the density of holes times its mobility and electric field is that okay so this is the uh, the current density due to the drift mechanism so this is directly proportional to the several factors one is the electric field that is uh, very clearly you can understand right if the field is very strong so the electrons will highly drift towards the field direction so you can have a high current density and of course it depends on the how many Uh, charge carriers are drifting towards the field direction it depends on the density of electrons and density of holes at the same time how mobile these charge carriers it depends on mobility if the charge carriers are not so mobile let's say it the mobility is very low then you cannot have a high current density okay and of course it depends on the uh, uh, collision rate and the effective mass and so on okay so 
I think all of you should remember that we are in a classical regime, right? So that's why I'm using classical mechanics uh, to write down all these velocities and the current densities. So because I'm in a, I'm in, interested in the classical diffusive transportism where the system size is much, much bigger than the mean free path and the phase coherence length. Okay. But if these equations will not valid in the remaining two regimes like uh, ballastic transport regime, you cannot use these equations that you have to keep in mind. Is that clear? Now let's take the one problem, the mobility of silicon electrons at 300 Kelvin is let's say 1100 centimeter square per let's say old second. Now what you have to calculate is calculate the main free path of electrons using effective mass m star is equal to 0 0.26 mass of an electron. Is the problem clear? Is the problem clear? Yes, sir. Now let's go to the second uh, transport mechanism called diffusion. diffusion current. So in the last uh, picture you understood that diffusion uh, current is due to the main, what is the main reason? Concentration gradient. So you can write down the concentration gradient, let's say Jn is directly proportional to how the density of electrons are changing with, let's say in the x direction. Okay we are interested in the, let's say one dimension. So let's say I have a system. So here I have a high concentration of holes. Then the other region, so there is a gradient, uh, concentration gradient. So similarly, you can write down, of course, holes is directly proportional to the rate of change of concentration of these holes. Uh, for the time being, uh, don't confuse with small n. Small n usually I'll call density of electrons, right? But in this case, these are concentration. What do you mean by concentration of electrons? Number of electrons per unit area. Okay. <clears throat> so same thing where P is the concentration of holes. So that means, uh, let's say, let me write down here the number of electrons per unit area. So small p is the number of holes per unit area. Okay. So I think now we can uh, write down, of course, it's directly proportional to charge of an electron, right? Charge of an hole also, right? Can I do that? This diffusion current density is directly proportional to, let me erase this first, okay, is directly proportional to concentration gradient at the same time let's say charge of an electron this is understandable right uh, 
it depends on charge of an electron also okay so let me draw the picture here now let's say this is my x axis now what happens in this region let's say electrons are very high but after some time what happens electrons will diffuse into the low concentration region so what is happening the gradient is decreasing with respect to x axis so there will be minus sign here because the gradient of these electrons are decreasing in the x direction let's say this is my x axis so that's the reason you will have minus sign and this is the charge of an electron is negative so and now i just a magnitude of an electron is mod e and then of course still we have proportional relation so dn over dx i don't want this proportionality so i have to put a some constant that's called dn this is the diffusion constant into charge upon charge of an electron that's just a magnitude and dn over dx okay is that clear Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. Now, similarly, you can write down for the holes is directly proportional to what is the charge of a hole? It's a positive charge. Okay. And same time, the holes will also decrease. In this case, let's say these are positive sign is for holes. Now, the holes concentration is also decreasing in the x axis in the x direction. So, minus dp dx. Do you understand why this minus sign is coming over dn dx or dp dx because the concentration is decreasing in the x direction that's why i put a negative sign so this is just a mod of an electron uh, charge of a uh, hole i took a mod uh, will be minus dp dx i want to put some proportional to constant that is dp so this is the diffusion coefficient for holes and charge of a hole dp dx okay so these are the two expressions for diffusion current due to the electrons and holes so now you can write down the <coughs> now the total current density due to the electrons yes uh, what about the minus sign in holes density ah okay i forgot here here Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I forgot that. Sorry. So now you can write down the uh, current density due to only electrons, due to the two different mechanisms. One is the drift and one is the diffusion. So mod of an electron uh, charge mu n. So this is because of the drift mechanism, and now this is due to the diffusion. T n over dx. Okay. Now similarly, you can write down for holes. That is, uh, mod of an elect charge of an electron density mobility times electric field. And now this is due to the diffusion of holes. So dp dx. Okay. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, I have a doubt about that yes. mobility. Yes. Please. Uh, sir, uh, as we considered the left part as electron uh, high region and the right part as hole high region. Okay. So if if uh, electron is uh, diffusing from the left region to the right region, then mm -hmm. uh, the electron concentration is increasing uh, in positive x direction. Hmm. Uh, then why are you considering minus dn by dx? Like if it should be positive, right? No, no. See, uh, here I'm talking about the gradient along the x-axis, right? Yes. So the gradient is decreasing as you move along the x-axis. That's what this negative sign convention. Uh, okay? Then, then, then what about the whole so means? Uh, yeah. If it is uh, more in electron then the yeah. right should then right. yes uh, then you have to do the same thing let's say you have a holes here initially 
Now, after some time, what happens? These holes will try to diffuse uh, into the low concentration region. Okay. So this this concentration, that small p, is also decreasing in the x-axis. So that is what my notation convention. Is that okay? Now let's say if you are talk, I think you, what your point is, you want to take in a this holes. Let's say holes are more here initially, and these holes are diffusing into the this region. What is that? That is what your point? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, electron then, electron yeah. Electron. Then what you have to do is you have to your gradient is along the negative x-axis. Then you have to put a dp d of minus x because your x in the opposite direction. Then also you will get a negative sign. Is that okay? Uh, can you please repeat once, sir? Okay. So in one region, electrons are more. In another region, holes are more, right? Concentration is high. Now let's say this is my x-axis direction. Now the electrons are diffusing into the right side region. So the concentration gradient is decreasing uh, when you are moving along the x-axis. That's what the negative sign. Now coming to the holes. Now the whole concentration is more in the right hand side region, this region. Now these holes are uh, diffusing towards the right. That means here. Okay. Then how do you write down D, TP, D minus X. So this gradient is in the opposite direction. This is the negative X axis. Is that okay? Do you understand? Uh, but uh, if we are considering like that, then uh, minus dp by uh, d of minus x, we should write like that, Nasa. dp? Minus Can dp you... by d of minus x. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. So maybe we'll take a minus sign. Uh, then tell me what happens now. Then minus minus should cancel out and minus uh, dp by dx only or something like that. Mm. Mm hmm. So does that N and P have any sign on, on them, like a con concentration? That they they are just concentration, right? No, just just they are just numbers, number of electrons per unit area. So I think uh, this confusion is coming because I'm treating these electrons and holes are in a separate notation. Uh, let's say uh, I'm uh, the way initially I explained, you know. Uh, let's say. Okay, uh, so in this time we have holes more here in the right side. Now they are decreasing when you are moving along the positive x axis. So I think that is what I consider here. That's why I got a negative sign. But what you are saying is uh, in one side you have holes, other side we have electrons. Uh, no, sir, I'm not saying that actually. I'm saying if an uh, electron is uh, decreasing from one region to another region, then uh, it should uh, means it, it is getting this place that means it, it is getting a hole in that region so okay now tell me uh, instead of all these discussions uh, is anything mistake in this notation let's say initially i started my holes in the right side region is high concentration now after some time the holes are decreasing towards the uh, as moving along the x axis is that is there any problem in this notation that's why I took a minus dp dx. Is there any problem in this equation? I, I, don't know. I mean, I thought okay, if mm -hmm. uh, electron is getting displaced, then it should create a hole in, in place of it. Right? So, so, so I asked about it. Okay. 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 So we'll see that point later. For the time being, I'm just talking. The, uh, the electron concentration is decreasing when you're moving along the x-axis. At the same time, the whole concentration is also decreasing when you're moving along the x-axis. Okay. So based on this picture, I wrote these equations. Is there any problem in these equations? No, sir. Okay. Now I'll try to take your question. Okay. After some time, uh, just let me finish this. Uh, so can I continue up to 11:15? Is that okay? 11:20.
please tell me quickly yes sir sri devi all of you betun pratik chandana can i continue up to 11:15 or 11:20 इंफॉर्मेशन अबाउट करंट डेंसिटी ड्यू टू द इलेक्ट्रॉन्स द फर्स्ट पार्ट ड्यू टू द ड्रिफ्ट एंड सेकेंड पार्ट ड्यू टू द डिफ्यूजन एंड सेम थिंग फॉर होल्स ओके so now uh, just uh, let me write down the j due to the drift is i have already written n times mu n plus p times mu p times charge of an electron right so the same the quantity in front of this electric field you can write down as sigma that is the conductivity okay and this is the conductivity sigma now once you know the conductivity you can calculate the resistivity as 1 over sigma that is conductivity right so 1 by mod of a, just a charge of an electron n into mu n plus p into mu p so here i'll give you one question so let's say the electron concentration concentration in a let's say silicon uh, sample is given by n of x is equal to n of 0 into e to the power of minus x over uh, let's say ln so okay where x greater than 0 so this is the concentration expression for the charge carriers its electrons in a silicon in the positive x direction okay now here i'll give you the values uh, with n of 0 is equal to 10 to the power of 17 it's a centimeter cube because this is the uh, just a density right Uh, number of electrons per unit volume, and L n is the four micrometer. This is the length of the system. Now, what I'm asking is, you just calculate the diffusion current density. Calculate the diffusion current density. as a function of position here i'm giving the diffusion coefficient for electrons is 30 cm square per second so this is the problem based on diffusion current density so i'll take few more uh, just a five minutes and then i'll try to finish the discussion so so far any questions so far any questions no sir now let me try to derive the relation between diffusion coefficient and the mobility those are called einstein relation i think some of you are uh, just left the meeting pratik are you there see he is not responding sri devi
she is not responding i think she is not here at all okay okay so i'm going to derive the, the relation between diffusion coefficient and the mobility so these relations are called einstein's relation so here i'm interested only in the intrinsic semiconductors do you remember the intrinsic semiconductor what is the intrinsic semiconductor what do you mean by intrinsic semiconductor the concentration of electrons and holes are equal yes so there will not be any dopants okay so i think in few uh, i don't know when i derived but in previous class in my previous class i just derived the derived the the charge carrier concentration expressions do you remember just go back to my previous video and see so this is the electron density expression uh, in intrinsic semiconductor okay you just go back to the previous lecture and see i am just using those expressions where ec is the minimum of the conduction band where mu is the chemical potential so uh, this me star is the effective mass i think this expression you can write down simply as n into i so this constant i am treating as n in ni times e to the power of minus beta ec minus mu okay so this is the uh, electron density expression in a intrinsic semiconductor now what happens at equilibrium what happens at equilibrium so the moment of charge carriers will not happen right and at the equilibrium the fermi energy remains constant so there will not be change in the fermi energy with respect to the position so the rate of change of fermi energy with respect to the position will be zero and also i am talking about equilibrium so the current density becomes zero okay now this is what happens at the equilibrium now i want to calculate the d Uh, the change in the concentration as a function of x can anybody tell me how to do this uh, differentiation using this expression look at this n i is constant right so i can take it outside do do x e to the power of minus beta ec minus mu is that okay i'll tell you why i'm calculating the derivative of this n with respect to x <clears throat> so n i what is the differentiation of e to the power of minus beta ec minus mu and do do x of uh, minus beta into ec minus mu okay so i think uh, i can take it beta outside right so there will be minus beta to do x of ec minus to mu do x okay uh, i just told you right this chemical potential is somewhat related to the fermi energy right of course it depends on the temperature so this quantity becomes zero in equilibrium situation minus n i beta do do x what is ec what is ec Amit, 
Yes, sir. What is EC here? EC is the conduction and energy. Conduction and energy. energy. Yeah, conduction band energy of an electron, right? So yes, sir. How how can you write down this uh, energy? Uh, maybe let's say, can I write down the energy E times V? Let's say this is the potential gradient. Can I write like this? Yes, sir. So let's say this is the applied potential, okay? Due to the external field. The charge of an electron, I can take it outside. But usually the electron charge will be negative, right? So I'm just using the charge of an electron Q is equal to minus E. So this minus minus becomes plus. Okay. So dou V dou X uh, N I beta E. Now this is the gradient of the potential that is nothing but the electric field with a negative sign. Is that okay? This is the field. Do you remember this EC is the energy of an electron in the conduction band, but this capital E is the electric field. So dou N dou X can be written as minus N I beta E times the charge of an electric, uh, uh, electric field. Okay. So now I can write down the total current density due to the electron is mod E density, mobility of an electron and electric field plus charge of an electron, diffusion coefficient and dn dx. Okay. Now I can substitute here. Uh, this is mod E. What is uh, dn dx minus ni beta E times an electric field. Okay. So basically this N I is nothing but this N because just this is the concentration. Okay. I think you can uh, write down here N is equal to N I. So I can remove this suffix I. Okay. That's just a density of an electron. Now we are instead in equilibrium condition, right? So in equilibrium condition, the charge, uh, the current density will be zero. So you can write down electric field. You can cancel. What else I can cancel? N I can cancel. Uh, okay, that's it. So here we have a mu N times electric field is equal to other side. We have a diffusion coefficient of an electron beta charge of an electron electric field. I think electric field also can cancel. So therefore, you can write down the mobility of an electron is equal to d n times e over kbt. Okay, beta is equal to one by kbt. So similarly, you can write down the mobility of holes is equal to dp. That is the diffusion coefficient of an electric holes charge of a hole and kbt. Okay, so this relation is valid only under the equilibrium condition that you have to keep in mind. And this is only for the intrinsic semiconductors, not for the extrinsic. So by using these two relations, you can find out the diffusion coefficient in terms of mobility or uh, diffusion coefficient of, uh, of this relation. It depends on the temperature. Okay. Uh, I have a problem for you, but uh, there's no time, so we'll discuss some after some time. Or maybe I'll uh, put this question in the, in the board. Okay, so now let me, uh, with this, I think uh, I'm done with the carrier transport mechanism in semiconductors. So, so far, any questions? what will be the modification if we use uh, extrinsic semiconductors can you repeat your question 
what will be the, the modification modification if we use extrinsic semiconductor then should it be followed the einstein's formula ah okay then you have to use this concentration expression no charge carrier density expression you have to derive this so first of all the changes will happen here this expression you have to do it again because this concentration of electrons will contain some contribution from the dopants okay so here there will be some dope atoms they will contribute more extra electrons or more extra holes so that term will come and rest is same okay sir any questions so far ah uh, what time you have a class next class at 12 time sir 12 12 o'clock yeah. okay okay so i just want to tell you all of you this time the question paper will be tough so please uh, put some extra time okay that's what i want to tell you so so i think all of you know that the first minor will be on 25th of this month i think it's on friday okay so exam will start at 9:30 to 10:30 so the syllabus should be the syllabus will be up to today's class okay sir up to today's class so is the is there any workshop going on or like any conference or uh, amit do you understand my question so any of our students are attending any other extra classes uh, workshop or conferences pratik and sridevi is doing internship sir okay mm -hmm. so this is what i don't like okay i'll talk to them at least they are not even informing because here i cannot see them see and they are just log in and they are not even responding because they are attending in other classes as a teacher they should at least uh, give a small information to me uh and i'll talk to them uh, so so for any questions i am telling you all of you the exam will be tough if you have any doubts or questions in my previous classes please Uh, try to clarify before the exam. Okay. Okay. If so, if no questions, I'm going to stop it here. Sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, yes, Chandra. So this is the first time you're talking in your in this uh, course. Am I correct? N no. no. No, sir. Okay. Good. No. Uh, tell. okay so which part you are talking about okay so i to i gave you the definition two things which are uh, as straight forward like gave you one is the energy levels of an electron in a external perpendicular magnetic field so that is en this expression where omega c is the cyclotron frequency okay where n is the orbital index let's say first orbit second orbit and so on so usually n will take Uh, 0 1 2 3 and so on okay where omega c is the cyclotron frequency which expression is eb bar by uh, eb by m star and another expression which i gave you is the magnetic length that is lb is equal to h bar over eb under root so here i give you a few steps to understand how i got this uh, length lb basically this is the radius of the cyclotron orbit 
cyclotron orbit okay now this part you didn't understand sir my network was down then so i can't hear you well okay. so what can i do so i'll upload this lecture video in the google classroom okay can i repeat this part once again or is it clear my voice now it's okay uh, if if you do that i go in watch sir okay no, so sure. here i'm just calculating the radius of this uh, orbit uh, the cyclotron orbit of an electron in a perpendicular magnetic field by equating the magnetic force that is e times v times b of course there will be sin theta but perpendicular magnetic field so theta will be 90 degrees sin 90 will be 1 so we equate to the uh, the centrifugal force mv square by rc where rc is the radius of the cyclotron orbit okay but what happens in this cyclotron orbit the electron will have a angular momentum an integral multiple of n times h bar so i just equated the angular momentum l is equal to n into h bar so from this expression you can calculate the radius of this orbit in terms of this magnetic field of course this square root of n factor is a constant because n can take value 0 1 i think not 0 it starts from 1 to i think okay then this is the dimension of having a length h bar over eb this is what i'm calling a magnetic length okay so that is what here i given as the magnetic length okay so okay i'm going to stop it because it's already 11:30 so you can take uh, 30 minutes break for the next class so if further if you have any questions you can uh, send me in whatsapp group i'll try to answer sir can you please tell me from which book we should uh, study this portion hmm that's a okay so i think uh, so this course you know when i started i gave one reference book in the our uh, whatsapp group that is related to the uh, the low dimension systems like quantum wires wells and uh, quantum dots but many of the topics which i'm teaching you know are introduction to solid state physics so maybe you can refer some uh, basic solid state physics books like by uh, charles kitten introduction to solid state physics okay or you can take another any other solid state physics book you can find these things no sir i am talking about this portion uh, the semiconductor charge carriers that's what i am telling in solid state physics book you can find these expressions the charge carrier density expression drift velocity and so on but i don't think diffusion they may not talk about diffusion uh, uh, okay i think uh, Uh, okay so so far i can tell you this one uh, but if i find any book i'll share in the whatsapp group okay sir so please try to solve these problems the problems which i am posting in the in between the lecture are very important you have to i think they can straight forward problems just before the problem there will be one formula you can just substitute and you can get the answer that's it Okay I'm stopping here. Thank you everyone. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you.